Bon, voilà. maintenant, euh, je vais présenter euh, votre, euh, pour votre présentation d'abord, que vous avez 30 minutes. Et euh, si vous voulez commencer maintenant, je vous remercie beaucoup et bienvenue. Merci beaucoup. D'accord. So, thank you, professor, and uh, thank you also for your sort of kind introduction. And uh, uh, I hope I won't disappoint you uh, with my, my paper. Uh, and thank you, of course, uh, to Van Lang University, to all the organizers like IRASEC, of course, uh, and uh, all the, the, the participants today. Um, so, um, Yes, so I will start uh, my, uh, can you see my slides? Yes, properly? Yes. Yes, oh, thank you. So um, the first 10 minutes, I will, I will present, uh, as you said, this upcoming uh, book um, uh, entitled Fieldwork and the Self, Changing Research Styles in Southeast Asia, uh, a book uh, I'm editing with uh, Professor Victor King, a uh, major anthropologist uh, of Southeast Asia. And so I will present first the, some key ideas uh, of this, um, this book, uh, a book that should be released uh, in September with uh, Springer the, as publisher. Then I will move to my personal account and ethnography on uh, Kaudaism. So, so this book uh, is a contribution to uh, epistemological debates and on the concept of the universal or global and the local, uh, but also on the insider and outsiders, uh, but also on the crucial role played uh, by the personal experiences and self-reflexivity of fieldwork in the process of collecting and analyzing data. So in terms of structure, this volume sheds lights on the personal accounts most of the time, as we, we call some confessions uh, of a range of academics who have undertaken research in and on Southeast Asia. And we ask them how they have engaged with their uh, subject of study, with their own subjectivity, and by extension with the Southeast Asia uh, as a region. So it's necessary to recognize that a pact of objectivity is required in the methodological manuals between the researcher and their, their scientific production. This pact should guarantee both the authenticity of the data collected and at the same time fidelity uh, to the field and the informant. After the self-critical filter of any personal engagement and subjectivity. Subsequently, when the self reveals too much, it seems often narcissistic, narcissistic and self-indulgent and above all, unreliable. Scientific writing usually erase uh, the imprint of the I uh, and present the experience of fieldwork in a cold and objective way. Scientific writing usually has preferred for a long time this, the misleading, invisible, but omnipresent we of the scientific narrator erasing their subjective traces. And very often we have the opportunity to read in many manuals of anthropology and many, even some monography, uh, the expression, we have met the village chief, we have eaten this fruit with fruit. The shaman told us uh, the secret of his portion. We went to these archives, etc., etc. If most textbooks on methodology in the social sciences have raised issue on the temptation uh, of egocentrism uh, in the author, we should go deeper, we think. Egocentrism is not a temptation, actually, or a risk, but comprise evidences. And subsequently, it becomes not only an influence, but a parameter to be taken into account by the researcher at all times during the research process, during the pre-field, data collection, analysis, publication, return to the field, and so forth. This upcoming volume aims to take into account the core of the intellectual and subjective activity of the researcher in their methodological quests 
for objectivity. And I'm referring here to the advice by, that the famous uh, sinologist Marcel Granet would have given to his student, uh, Georges Dumézil, a famous linguist. And he said, a method is the road after we have traveled it. Here, Granet invites the researcher to remember that the right method for field research is a a posteriori construction of the fieldwork. It is a friction with the fieldwork, the adaptation of the researcher to such a situation, to his her personality, to the object of study, etc., and the introspection after the fieldwork, which will allow the building and justification of a method uh, that the researcher had not clearly defined beforehand, although researchers spend most of their time to pretend it. In this volume, we have involved 17 <coughs> research, researchers, including the two co-editors, working on Southeast Asia across a range of disciplines, encouraging them to move their focus from their informant or interlocutors to, and to engage in their own relationship to the researcher, to the research field, and mm -hmm. the way in which their fieldwork construct them as a researcher. Author address the ways in which they collect the data and analyze and interpret the information in interaction with their fieldwork. Indeed, the circumstances of the fieldwork and the scientific value of the data collected depend largely on the character of the researcher, their education, personal education, personal history and temperament, their preferences and dislike, etc. But how the fieldwork transformed them? How did they come to choose a field site and one research theme ra rather than another? How have they felt and thought about the transformation of their fieldwork over the years and their publication? What are the intellectual, methodological, and personal orientations that have led them to his research, to this research. To answer these many questions was considered by all authors as a further proof of honesty, giving peers and other readers access to the possible truth as it appears to them, as far as they can know it. They are engaged in considering what we can say after uh, Lejeune, the inevitable oversights, errors, involuntary distortion in their approach and understanding of the fieldwork, explicitly indicating the field to which this oath of honesty applies. Like, likewise, it seems relevant for, for, from an epistemological perspective to explore how the practice of confession can be conceived by the researcher as the ability to revisit their relationship with their field research and to clarify the logic of conju or conjunctures which allow them to access this particular field research and information. Finally, the confession mode used consciously by a, a scholar is therefore not so much a alienating or dissociating process, but rather an emancipatory one, crystallizing a desire for renewal the ability to look in the face of one's past action is a process of fieldwork. Secrecy, like lies, can be a major obstacle in the search for truth. However, several authors have already demonstrated in their respective ethnographic a lie-generating situation. The issue of secrecy and secrets which might become meaningful. Um, meaning yes. So the issue of secrecy and secrets, which might become meaningful data in their own right. Among scholars uh, who explore the meaning behind line, lies and secrets in terms of field findings, we can quote Marcel Griol, uh, Barnes, and Susan Thompson, for instance. I address this topic within my long-term studies of Kaodaism or Kaodai 
religion and mean spirit medium group in Vietnam during the past two decades of comparative research in religious studies and social anthropology. I suggest that fieldwork and working in the archives and on other primary sources requires us to read between the lines, interpret the unsaid, to refute lies, gather clues, which might finally give meaning to the sociological world. This is not possible without considering secrecy as a major social fact, somehow compensated by, for by the ingenuity of field technique, as say Passant. In an article published for the first time in 1906, the German sociologist George Zimmel presented his interest in the philosophical and sociological study of secrecy. If the sociological, if the social use, sorry, of secrecy is explicitly required for certain profession, such as doctors, priests, lawyers, among others, Zimmel did not limit himself to these sociological units, but considered that social structures as a whole can be distinguished according to the part of the secret which is at, the, at work in social interaction. So I caught here uh, a major paragraph uh, of, uh, so from uh, George Zimmel. Secrecy, he said, in this sense, which is effective through negative or positive means of concealment is one of the greatest accomplishment of humanity. Secrecy procures enormous extension of life because with publicity, many sorts of purposes could never arrive at realization. He said, secrecy secures, so to speak, the possibility of a second world alongside of the obvious world. And the latter is most strenuously affected by the former. Every relationship between, the, between two individuals or two groups will be characterized by the ratio of secrecy that is involved in it. If, even when one of the parties does not notice the secret factor, yet the attitude of the concealer and consequently the whole relationship will be modified by it." End of quote. The topic of secrecy became all the more obvious to me from the time that I worked on a new Vietnamese religion, Cao Dai, from 1997 onwards. Many historians and sociologists have interpreted this religion as a contemporary expression of, of the resilience of Chinese secret societies in Vietnam. I will decipher this the way the way of followers of Cao Dai have, have invoked secrecy in the relationship with the ethnographer and how I located myself in this ambiguous situation to get access or not to secrets. Finally, the contours of a heuristic paradigm of what I call homo secretus will be outlined in which the secret real or presented as such, becomes an inherent dynamic, not only of the social bond of power relations with, within patterns of a society with secrets, but also of the work of the researcher. Kaudai found its real roots, I say uh, uh, Smith or origins in mean religious associations, themselves the years of a tradition of Chinese and Sino-Vietnamese secret societies. From the Yuan dynasty in the 13th, 14th century onwards, this organization took the form of associations of Buddhist devotees, which incorporated Taoist beliefs and practices. The mode of communication with the spirits, the so-called Fuji, to hold the G, uh, meaning the instrument or spirit writing, uh, spirit medium writing, the Ke in Vietnam, in Vietnamese, is intrinsically part of the formation 
and development of this movement. So in Kaodai, the Fuji, the Chinese Fuji method of communication the spirit is called kabut. So the pencil to hold the, 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 the pencil, the, br the brush, the pen. I therefore began my analysis of Kaodaism with a classic ethnography of the Kaodai who wrote Chanya Temple in Vitry sur Seine, a southern suburb of Paris, as you can see a picture here. So during my MA and then my M field in 1999, 2000. In this temple, I had the opportunity to attend several spirit medium seances while recording and studying gesture, posture, behavior, sounds, silences, which is the role of the participant observer. Along with my PhD in comparative sociology and ethnology at Paris 10, Nanterre University, I widened, I broadened my perspective by spending four months day and night in the Kaodai temple of Binhua in Yadin, Bintan district, right, the northern suburb of Ho Chi Minh City at that time. And then follow the net different network, the different correspondence uh, and uh, bridging uh, uh, moment between this temple and other uh, Kaodai temple in Southern Vietnam and uh, North Vietnam as well. It is on the basis of this ethnographic data that I expanded my exploration of Kaodai spirit medium practices and networks which was the topic of my PhD thesis and of my updated and published monograph. Yes, so my Kaodai host insisted that I follow a vegetarian diet, uh, an chai, with the other member of the temple. And after two weeks, I acquired a white tunic and a black turban, which, this, which are distinctive signs of the Kaodai devotees. These two prerogatives uh, afford me the opportunity to access pure spaces, uh, formerly forbidden uh, to non-devotees, especially the main altar with the image, as you know, of the eye of the master Kaodai, the supreme male deity of the Kaodaism. The charisma of the priest of the temple, Nyo Van Ang, who I'm observed in my entourage, but also in my own relations and emotion connect, emotional connection with him, was a natural entrance into the life of the temple, in which I share with 30 or so adepts the meals, the nights, the daily, and funeral, funeral rites. The notion of charisma is a fairly classic theme in social sciences, as you know. In other words, I was inclined to believe that people become charismatic because they are, they are out of the ordinary or, and or because they hold secret or secrets, which give them not only authority and respect, but also a cachet of mystery. I was naturally inclined to transforming my fieldwork experience into a kind of detective story, pure showing meager tracks of a dead ends, unfortunately, but also tracking clues, cross-checking checking my deduction with facts or readings that constitute the field investigation. I therefore collected and list the natural characteristic or distinctive signs of people I met, like the size of the bird, length, of air, the place of mole on the face, protuberance on the forehand, length of fingernails, uh, skin texture of the hands, etc., etc., which are the most meaningful in the Kaodai context to detect some charismatic signs. Furthermore, I list and collected certain elements of esoteric knowledge for which they will be the only ones or the rare ones on, on, to hold and to keep secretly. I also came to approach secrets in Kaodai community after I came across more than a decade ago, an unpublished manuscript, so 
uh, the translate secret societies and all societies is secrets dynamics of dissent and conformism in traditional Vietnam, which is a paper written by uh, George Boudarel and found in his collection run by the library of the Institute, Institute d'Asie Orientale at Lyon, which collects uh, the massive uh, collection of all the work of George Boudarel. The writing of Talisman is a recurring dimension in the liturgy of all the frequently referred to Kaodai oratories. In my field work, the supernatural interpretation of talisman are part of the stock of emic resources permanently available to followers of Kaodai to legitimize the position of a dignitary in the hierarchy. The mastery of this practice leads high dignitaries to leave the premises of the temple regularly to exercise uh, their demon exercised powers in another temple or in someone's house, house. And yet, this type of secret ritual knowledge, which I have referred as talismanic writing, is very rarely emphasized and even less study in previous works on the Kaodaism or even in other Vietnamese religious movements. The ritual procedure in question consists of writing of talisman, hua bu, also called han thep, administrating a sacrament, as Kao Dai translated, or doing the religious law, the dharma, or doing a talisman, lam thep. The ritual knowledge that this writing requires is designated within Kao Daism by the writings or or secret signs, be tick, or secret law, be fat. The exits, as exits, the commentators commonly translate these ritual prerogatives into French or English through the notion of sacrament, uh, referring to the Catholic translation. In Kaodaism, the practice of a sacrament is granted only to dignitaries, Tuxac and especially to those who take the oath to keep esoteric knowledge secret, who follow a completely vegetarian diet, and who have a pure mind and unshakable faith in Master Kaodai or Mother Yeochi Kimmo. This talisman takes a substantial place in the everyday life and religious representation of the faithful. In my fieldwork, I had the opportunity to see dignitaries doing talisman, talisman there are many occasions. First, marriage, wedding, is the occasion of a protective talisman for the future life of a couple. We can also have that during the installation of an altar or a statue, during the inauguration of a house, to, to pose the genie of the spirit in this place, the healing talisman, for, of course, is used for serious illness and to cleanse fault, to better elevate karma, etc. It is during funerals that demonifuge or talismanic rituals play the most dramatic and grandest sequences in Kaodai practices. Here we can, you can see in this picture the sacrament of cutting the seven roots of or early earthly ties uh, aims to cut the seven points, seven points of the, the vital, vital fluid. In other words, uh, the the invisible and revengeful ropes of karma. These ropes are these bonds and uh, are linked to the feet of the dead symbolically, and prevent the spiritual component from leaving the material body and being fully released. Moreover, a major talismanic writing around the coffin, as you can see, confers at the end of funerals, the mystery of deliverance, as the Kaodai call it, or ascension, Han Fep Do Tang, with the objective of helping a soul to be saved and to join the eternal homeland. homeland. There are, in fact, very few documents 
providing the information on these talismanic practices, origin and power, and how it is appropriate for a dignitary, a leader, to execute it in, in order to be effective. According to my observation at the beginning of my fieldwork, a talisman consisted of a mysterious Chinese character written by a dignitary. All the main informants said, yes, the leader used a Chinese character, but we don't know which one. That a leader used with three sticks of incense, a pistil of flowers, as you can see here. D'accord, thank you. And, but the Chinese, the identity of the Chinese character was communi communicated to me one time by a 60 year old exegete, the so called Duke Nguyen, uh, which whom I'm sympathizing. And he offered me a rare booklet on this practice uh, where he described me, he depicted me uh, that this recurring character drawn is a Chinese character, Heaven, uh, Tian. And the dignitary has to write this uh, uh, character uh, on different parts of uh, the, the ritual to uh, allow this uh, uh, exorcised ritual. The most striking case uh, which caused many debates in the field, my fieldwork was the revelation by Duke Nguyen of the secret of the talisman. My knowledge of this character, thanks to the revelation or maybe the betrayal of secrecy, gave rise to some very heated debates between the dignitary, as you can imagine. But thanks to that, I was surprised, but many uh, person, Kaodai people, uh, free up their, their uh, ideas, their tongues, thanks to that, and they start to give me more details uh, because Duke Nguyen start to open the door of sharing secrets. Yet in, so I will, yet in my uh, different uh, fieldwork, I was confronted with another uh, epistemal role played by family secrets. And so I will skip here because it's very too long, I'm afraid. Uh, and as you can say, as you can see here, most of my, the Kauda informant uh, use a lot of pseudonyms, alias, okay, uh, in different occasions. It can be uh, during the family, they use a special intimate name within a house, a temple of a branch. During the literature, the same person can use, or someone else can use for this person um, uh, a, pen, a pen name uh, for uh, writing his publication or comments even sometimes for using a journalist paper. During the, in, within the hierarchy, uh, a same person can use a different name uh, according to religious rank uh, in their lifetime. And even during the, wor the worship, uh, some people can have another name of a, a mythical deity who appeared during spirit me medium seance, and sometimes have a post-mortem name given to a person who can have have become immortal after death. So you see the complexity for the ethnographer to connect the dots, to understand who is who, okay? Uh, and actually I spent years <laughs> to, <laughs> to understand who was who. And when we write in a paper that Mr. Uh, Chi Dat here write this paper, you have to know after years that this person is uh, Mr. Nguyen uh, Hu Nguyen. Okay, who was in another paper called Ho, Ho, uh, Zoe, etc., etc. So you can imagine the complexity. And thanks to that, I start to uh, I spend years actually to uh, uh, to decrease to depict all these uh, names in the history of Kaudaism. Okay, and I try to uh, to find this culture. I call the culture of pseudonym, of pen names, hide actually a very recurring nepotistic logic, a clientelist 
no mm. logic. Be because it's, it is actually legitimized uh, by the spirits uh, that some people, uh, uh, some cousins, some uh, wife, some children were uh, 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 actually uh, be become uh, uh, at the highest rank of the hierarchy thanks to some uh, spirit medium sciences. Uh, so here you can hear the, the famous pop, Le Van Chung, uh, another here example is the example of uh, Latin folk. One of the 12 first mediums is very defying topic uh, in Tainin because uh, his mother, mother was appointed a priest at the, of the administration. Uh, his young brother was the first uh, spirit amateurs and also was uh, appointed by the spirits of his brother, uh, connected by his brother um, uh, as official medium, et cetera, et cetera. And the same married with another an, uh, uh, woman who become a pupil priest, et cetera, et cetera. So you see all the, uh, the clientelist, clientelist relationship. So, to <clears throat> so as you see, in many ways, the researcher in social sciences and humanities aims to reveal secrets. Mm -hmm. That is to say, to divulge new and often obscure knowledge uh, known by a small number of people, or at least presented as such. So, according to Clifford Gates, uh, the anthropologist can be defined as an author whose scientific credibility and authority for their analysis and methodology are their style. I would extend this by specifying that such style, which could be described as fictional or imaginary, is based on a part of secrecy among the author's fieldwork and the various form of pre-field, the pre-terrain as Condominas said it, or the knowledge surrounding the fieldwork, readings, images, representation, etc., of the data. So field research, and I will conclude, implies a certain amount of mutual concealment, a normative mix of clarity and vagueness in the study society and its constituent individuals and in the researcher. One of my uh, most difficult question was how to, uh, to find a solution, as you can say, in this uh, deal, constant deal with secrecy. Uh, and what I've decided actually is um, to only mention my research on Cardaism, the, the review of my field data and all of my own reflexive work benefited, benefited at intervals from my collaboration and my co-writing of articles with other researchers. Mm -hmm. Such a collaborative work was able to unveil hidden data, at least to my humble observation, to the various perspectives. Yeah. So I was able to uh, to work in with uh, on the gender topics, on this uh, on discipline uh, debates, or cultural areas with different collaborative work that I I will uh, you can see here different collaborative uh, publication. In the same vein, whatever the size of the social group study, its numerous areas of secrets invite us to keep in mind the modesty of the research work the necessity not to territorialize one fieldwork, to limit to, uh, our fieldwork to our own and to, to give our, uh, to print our own signature on it, on it, but to consider it, to consider fieldwork in its full and complex, what I call, and I finish it, a complex translocality, transdisciplinary, transgenderism, and transhistoricity. I mean, the fieldwork should be seen as a crossroad of data collected about a similar uh, research object according to different places, disciplines, genders, genders and period respectively. Thank you for your, for, for your patience uh, and, and I hope you, you have some, some comments and questions. Merci.
Chiyo, 